Welcome to the Union News Podcast. The UK's only All Things Union podcast, designed for your downloadable digital delight and appreciation. In this episode... What could happen is that we, we say, oh, well, competition law collides with employment law and workers lose. Because the, the reality would be is if you say, OK, well, what if I only work for Uber? What if I choose to not to work for any mm. Uber? And I say, ah, well, Uber is going to give me minimum wage. I'm going to do this, that and the other. And if I only work for Uber, the Supreme Court seems to be saying I'm entitled to have all my time protected. Welcome to a special episode of Union Jews, the UK's only all things union podcast. I'm Simon Sapper, and that was James Farrer, General Secretary of the ADCU, the App Drivers and Couriers Union, on the Supreme Court ruling that famously established that Uber drivers are workers and not self-employed. You can see from what James said that the Supreme Court ruling is not the end of the controversy surrounding Uber generally and when it comes to union organisation in particular. In a recent Union Dues episode, we heard from GMB national organiser Martin Smith about the groundbreaking deal negotiated between the union and the company. You can find that episode wherever you access your podcasts from. But the co-complainants in the Supreme Court case were the ADCU, who responded carefully to the news of the GMB Uber deal. ADCU welcomed the news, but said there were significant obstacles that prevented it from seeking something similar at the present time. So... What are those obstacles and can they be overcome? As one of the so-called new unions, typically high energy, very agile, reps closely in touch with members, how does ADCU actually work? In this episode, I chat with James about all this and much more, like the relationship with the GMB and the future of work and unionisation itself for app-based workers. James Farrer, General Secretary of the App Drivers and Couriers Union, ADCU. You are very welcome to the Union Juice podcast. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Listeners, as you'll be aware, the ADCU was one of the co-plaintiffs, is it, I suppose, with the GMB? Claimants, sec- yeah. Claimants, <laughs> claimants that, that secured, secured a historic Supreme Court ruling to say that Uber drivers were workers and not self-employed uh, uh, earlier this year. And then... Since since then, the GMB surprised, I think, everyone, perhaps even themselves, by securing a recognition deal of sorts with, with, with Uber. And regular listeners will know we spoke to Martin Smith, the GMB's national organiser, about that a few a few weeks ago. So to start off, James, I mean, tell, tell us about ADCU. I mean, how long have you, it's been in existence? What's its kind of kind of structure? How, how, how do you work? Well, we've been around since uh, 2015 in one form or another. We started off our, our life as... Um, United Private Hire Drivers Association, um, affiliated uh, to the IWGB, and then went independent from the IWGB in 2020. And we've been growing leaps and bounds since then. So one way or another, we've been around since 2015. I think that's kind of the historical arc of this fight with Uber as well, uh, started in 2015. I think that's when we started that action. But it's been, you know, it's been a very interesting time because back back then, you know, Uber was, I mean, you couldn't open a Harvard Business Review, but every company wanted to be the Uber of this or the Uber of that. Uber was the darling of the new economy and had a really, you know, really positive image here in the United Kingdom. So we had to, we had a long campaign to educate not only the workforce, uh, well, the workforce educated us, but to educate policymakers and, and the general public about what was really going on. Yeah, and of course, there was a, a landmark when, when TfL suspended Uber's license to operate in London. And, and the interaction between Uber and the transport regulatory network, I think, is quite important. And I'm sure it's something we'll come back to late, later in our discussion. Now, when when the, so when the GMB uh, announced its recognition deal, ADCU put out a, a statement, really, I thought was really interesting, a very carefully worded statement that basically said, well, this is good. Anything that increases the union footprint in Uber is good, but. And, and the but was that in ADCU's view, 
there were, I think you called them significant obstacles that prevented you seeking a similar sort of agreement. Now, what are those those obstacles? Well, firstly, you know, when we when we heard about this deal with Uber, we were literally sitting online with the Employment Tribunal already starting the next phase of the Supreme Court battle. So the Supreme Court wasn't the end. It's barely <laughs> barely the beginning in a way, because it clarified that we're workers, but now the battle is over. Well, when are we workers? What what is the working time? And that's actually quite a complex set of proceedings. And we were we were sitting in that. So, you know, obviously our our you know our view of Uber and of this agreement is going to be quite careful, measured and tempered, because in the reality, while Uber is is uh, you know is heralding this great agreement, you know we're still trapped in litigation with a firm that does not still want to honour the Supreme Court ruling and pay proper working time. And so I think we have to be quite careful and measured about where Uber is coming from. The other thing we have to look at is we have to look at what Uber's record is. And in your, I listened very carefully to the podcast you did with um, Martin Smith. And you raised the question quite rightly about how Uber's behaved with Proposition 22 in California. Mm-hmm. But it isn't just there. I mean, Uber has come to uh, a couple of months ago, just published a white paper on what's essentially a Proposition 22 vision for, for Europe. And in that paper and in the PR that Uber put out about that, it heralded its agreement in Italy with the small union there. Now, that agreement has been attacked by all the major unions and the Italian government uh, as been as been a fake uh, improvement, because what it's doing is locking uh, workers into this third category and denying them rights uh, over the long term. Now, this is not to say that this is what the GMB is doing. Uh, I think what the GMB, GMB is motivated by the right the right impulse here. Uh, all we're saying is, is that we have to be careful. We have to see where Uber lands on working time and where Uber lands on some of the other um, employment protections that we need, particularly around unfair dismissal. And that's not clear yet. And, and Uber hasn't made that position clear. So we're a little bit concerned about what Uber is saying uh, on the record with the GMB and how it's behaving in ongoing litigation. But also, um, there's another problem. Uber has gone to the high court. You know, what's at the center of the dispute with Uber is these contractual arrangements where Uber insists that the driver and the passenger are contracted together and Uber simply acts as an agent in the cloud. Well, rather than climb away from that contract model, which has been roundly trashed and rejected by all the courts that we've been before, Uber's gone to the high court to get a declaration there that this contract model is not in violation of transport regulations, which is what the Supreme Court <laughs> said it was, mm-hmm. albeit the comments were in Obiter, which so you know, they're not binding. But Uber has gone to the High Court to get that declaration. What they're trying to do there is to delink their worker rights obligations with their transport license obligations, which I think is dangerous when it comes to transport for London, the mayor of London. And secondly, what they're also trying to do is sidestep the VAT liability that it said itself, it told it, the stock market in, in, the, in the US in the filings there, that if it lost the Supreme Court uh, ruling, which it did, it expected it would be on the hook for VAT in Britain. Uh, and the estimates are it owes about two and a half billion pounds. So while Uber is saying that it's a reformed character, its actions suggest something else. So, so let, let me make sure I've, I've understood this correctly. That the, the Supreme the Supreme Court ruling was not ultimate and final because it depends on supporting rulings or actions to make to clarify the role of working time in in the whole sale terms and conditions there's no agreement on working time with uber i remember martin telling us that the the first thing the gmb had done is register a disagreement with the company uh, and and now and but you've just told us that adcu is kind of um a, a, a kind of a step ahead in, in that process in the sense that that there's there's a form of litigation in the form of employment tribunal claims there's that but secondly uber on the one hand is saying we're just neutral we're just a, we're a platform but on the other hand they're trying to dodge vat <laughs> payments and they're trying to set themselves outside the whole regulatory arrangement that protects both providers and consumers of transport that's right and it's also trying to sidestep an obligation that the mayor of london should uh, uphold, but has not, and transport for London to protect workers that are licensed. And this is, you know, if you look across to New York City, this is exactly what the mayor of New York has done. He has protected the workers under the transport uh, licensing arrangements uh, that New York City has with Uber. And we don't have that here. And th- that's one of the great 
tragedies here is that, you know, all this has gone on under the <laughs> oversight of regulatory authorities, both in London and councils up and down the country, have not stepped in when they, you know, continuously deny that they have the power to do so, but they quite patently do. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, that. I mean, we need to ask we need to ask the leaders of those authorities about <laughs> about that, I suppose. But I mean, the other thing that, that was well, very interesting. Well, well, I I can say we've we've we're working with uh, Foxglove Legal actually, and we've we've began the process of a judicial review on this. Okay. Um, uh, what are the timescales for that? Because it would be a very interesting, I mean, absolutely essential thing to 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 see an outturn from. Well, we're we're in pre litigation correspondence at the moment, so um, we're we're. You know, the pre-action through through the pre-action protocol phases, uh, and we have to we have to work through that carefully because that's your obligation before the courts to do that. We could we could see an outcome tomorrow. It's a political choice for mayors and for councils up and down the country to do something. The other thing is is, is whether or not Uber is, despite the, the things that we we've, we've spoken about in the last five t- ten minutes, is becoming, I don't know, more anglicised, more Europeanised. This this idea that they entered the market as disruptors and now they're more more an established part 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 of it. And I suppose there's always a debate to be had about whether or not there's, that's a cultural de- development or whether or not it's, it's dependent on the characteristics of the leadership of, of any organisation. And I, I, I gather ADCU's position is this is more about personalities than, than any sort of cultural metamorph- metamorphosis. Well, it's about the business model. I mean, the business model fundamentally has not changed. It's been whitewashed a little bit. I mean, I thought it was interesting to read a biography of um, Dara Khosrowshahi in the New York Times over the Mm. weekend. And I don't see any major transformation there. A few years ago, uh, Travis Kalanick was exposed by a publication, Verge, who had had some in in cab recording of an argument between Travis uh, Kalanick and uh, an Uber driver's complaining about what had happened, what had happened, earnings, what had happened. And and he said to them, he said, well, you know, this is all your fault. You know, some people don't want to take responsibility for their own, you know, you know what. Uh, that was his response. But then you read the New York Times and what Dara is saying is, well, in a rather more, you know, uh, nuanced way, is essentially the same thing. He says, for, you know, there's 10% of the drivers who can't figure it out, who can't figure out how to earn on the platform. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a problem. Maybe we need to build safeguards. But for about 10%, they can't figure it out. Now, this is the same message, essentially, that Travis gave uh, some years ago, except in a slightly more subtle way of saying mm. that if you're not earning, it's your fault. It's not our fault. It's your fault. I don't see any change in Uber. And I don't see any real uh, natural cultural adaptation either. The situation is the same. The contracts that I, I spoke about were born out of the Netherlands. They still are. The contractual model, they've doubled down on it, not, not reformed it. And the reality of the way the business is actually managed is really highly automated. Uh, so you're not really being managed by a European or a British or even American. You're being managed by an algorithm. Mm-hmm. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We know for the last six months of 2020, uh, 4,800 drivers were reported to Transport for London for a dismissal. The vast majority of them will have been from Uber. Uber's under pressure to police its platform, having won back its license in September 2020. So if you think in the height of the uh, of the pandemic, 4,800 drivers in six months out of probably an active population in London, about 40,000 drivers, that's monstrous. Mm. That's about 20% of the workforce being turned over um, every year. Now, that's not being done through proper appeals process, through a proper HR function. That's all been highly automated and semi-automated, and hence why we brought some of those uh, challenges um, against Uber on this in the Netherlands, because we say that those, those were automated firings, those were robo-firings. But that's that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a platform that has actually fewer and fewer managers and more and more automated processes. And even when drivers make an appeal, they find that the response is semi-automated. Uber is using natural language, language programming techniques to, to kind of analyze, do, do some word searching, see somebody making a heartfelt appeal for their job. Text um, suggestion comes up for the customer service agent. They just swipe across and send it. We know that because we see the same verbatim text again and again and again. Right. That's that's the that's the reality of the culture we're dealing with. A highly automated one. So the so the need for continuing organising and unionisation is clear. Whether whether it's under the GMB umbrella or under the ADCU umbrella. What what's 
what's your what's the ADCU's approach to organising and building the membership? In this sort of environment, well, it, there, there will have to be a continued continued organising, and of course, we've got a great deal of respect uh, for the GMB, for Mick Ricks, uh, and for the whole team over there, and what what they've achieved with this. Uh, our concern isn't with the GMB; our concern is with Uber, uh, and there is a need, and there is a need for continued organising. And I think you know when I listen carefully to what Martin Smith had had to say. He was quite candid and, and open and honest that the GMB had perhaps got it wrong back in 2015, 16. They were looking for uh, a boycott, a ban uh, of Uber, which would have put Uber drivers out of work. And how do you organize in that situation and so on? So we roll forward to where we are today. And, you know, the GMB now has an agreement with Uber, uh, which is great. And the weakness in that for for both Uber and the GMB is that it it, it risks being a top down approach, uh, with the GMB less connected now uh, at grassroots level because of decisions it made in 2015, 2016, whatever to move out of out of the space. Uh, so you know we all need to work together collaboratively to continue the organising because at the end of the day we're all one big union, aren't we? We're all fighting. Uh, for exactly the same thing. Uh, but it's essential that we keep that organizing pressure onto Uber. Now, what what is our approach to it? Well, firstly, I don't agree that there's anything particularly different about working for an app. But let, let's look at it from a legal perspective. If you read every one of the rulings that were made against Uber, the bench was never confused or befuddled about the, you know, the, the changing paradigm of app work. The work is exactly the same. The means of distribution is a little different, but that's all. You know, it's a, it's a person and a car has to go up and pick another person up and bring them somewhere. That's fundamentally hasn't changed and can't change. Uh, so we mustn't be confused about that. But in terms of our organizing, and this is where this is the key thing. There's nothing about the app distribution model that would have changed the organizing model because the workers are doing the exact same job that they did 20 years ago, which is driving people around. And I suppose, you know, the one thing that I also reject from, say, newer unions is this idea that there's a new way of organizing. There isn't a new way of organizing. There's only one way of organizing, and that is shoe leather organizing. And, you know, I know... Um, uh, Woody Allen has been kind of deplatformed these days, probably for good reason. But I like the quote from him that, you know, 50 percent of success is showing up. And I yeah. think this is the same for organizing. You know, you you show up consistently, stay engaged. And, you know, this idea about proximity organizing, I, I don't believe either. If you are addressing the needs of the workers and you're connected to those workers, then organizing is not a problem. <laughs> Proximity yeah. is not a problem. Uh, the problem comes if you're not if you're not connected to these workers, you're not addressing their needs and issues, uh, then you're not going to be able to organize in that workforce. It's as simple as that, really. Right. But so so therefore it's what you might call organic growth in the sense that yes, you have to be there, you have to show up, as you say, but but when you do show up and when there is the engagement, it's on things that actually your members talk about to their colleagues and and that in they they kind of do the organizing in in, in that way because people think blimey you know the union did a good job for person x they could do a good job for me and that's what i want to join well well that's right you know and i i think this is where we get caught up in this idea uh are we an individualistic union or are we acting for the collective the truth is you really do have to do both Mm, yeah. And and, yeah. and when when you serve an individual driver's problems, you get five more uh, will join up. It's as simple as that. And the opposite happens if you if you if you let down a member and their time of need, they leave and they take For five sure. people with them. Yeah, it is as simple as that. But I think you know uh, organizing in my mind, and uh, I'm by no means an expert. I'm a complete hack amateur. But in my mind, uh, there's always energy in the workforce. And you have to go to where that energy is. You have to go to where that organizing energy is. And you have to make the weather yourself a little bit. But if you're trying to, you know, make the weather where there is no energy, then, you know, you're not, you're not going to start a thunderstorm in November. No, 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 no. That's, that's a beautiful way of putting it. I have to say, I, re I, I really like that. But, and, and it's working, isn't it? Because, I mean, you're getting, you're getting into the hundreds of people joining you each, each month. 
Yes, yes, we are. I mean, it's it 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 has been astounding to see the growth closer to a thousand than the hundreds uh, yeah. every month, and and it's it's just been absolutely amazing to see that happen. Now there is an awakening uh, amongst the workforce that they need to be protected uh, and that they need protection from a union, but. But what I will say, though, um, that they need the protection not only from uh, employers like Uber, but I, I'm sorry to say this, but they also need protection from regulators like uh, Transport for London. I mean, they've become extremely aggressive uh, with precarious workers. So, for example, facial recognition failure, mm. an automatic revocation by Transport for London without right of appeal, an immediate revocation, immediate revocation. And I'll tell you one one particular case we've worked on, a chap called Imran Javed Raja, uh, who was Uber's facial recognition system, failed to recognize him. They deactivated him, reported him to Transport for London. Transport for London immediately revoked, would not listen to to a recommendation from us. We later established with Uber that they were incorrect. He had simply grown a beard. And that had to be reversed, and Transport for London had to reverse their decision. But this 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 poor man was out of work, and and even his vehicle was deregistered, so he couldn't he couldn't lease out the vehicle. So he was he was not only unemployed, but he was in severe debt because he had to mm. continue to um, service financing on the vehicle. Now there are many many more like him, and we've had a number of cases based on force, you know, faulty. Um, surveillance systems being used by Uber to authenticate uh, the idea of a driver in real time, and those systems are failing. Um, but uh, TfL is immediately revoking these drivers without proper appeal because Transport for London also feels the pressure to be policing these platforms and policing yeah. Uber aggressively. But it is these drivers to, uh, who have very little protection and safeguards are being uh, victimized uh, along the way. Goodness, goodness, there has to be a more balanced approach, surely, surely. I suppose growth brings its own sort of challenges in a way, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, you must be nearly at the point where where actually the balance between service and organising kind of shifts because you have so many more members. And, and if, if each of them has a problem like the one you've just described, James, and that's really resource hungry to, 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 to address. So... Do, how do you see the union, irrespective of all the Uber stuff, how, how do you see the union developing as it grows in, in kind of structural and governance terms? Well, it, it, growth is a, is a challenge, and uh, we're feeling the stress of that at the moment in hiring full-time staff. Uh, we are always have been pretty well organised around the country with elected committees in uh, Glasgow and Nottingham, Northampton, Birmingham, London, uh, and so on. So we, we've always been uh, pretty well devolved because you have to be transport is always a local business. Uh, so you do have to have a devolved organisation for this type of union. And I think there is a great deal of commonality. I suppose one of the thing, interesting things about working, so many of the workforce working for big platforms like Uber, Ola, uh, Amazon, um, Just Eat, Deliveroo, and so on, is that the problems are pretty consistently the same. And so we need to try and find a way. So while, while we have been fighting individual cases um, legally, we have to find a way of systematically addressing these problems as well. So we have organized actions against Bolt recently. We had some fairly huge demos and ferocious demos against Uber and National Strike uh, around its IPO uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, We'll we'll continue to do those demo actions, but we'll also continue to do strategic litigation uh, and we'll also continue to defend against licensing action. And, And here, Transport for London is almost alone in the level of aggression. Our casework is absolutely full of licensing threats, and all of this is coming from from platforms. But yes, growth is certainly putting a lot of pressure on our organisation at the moment. But as you say, the, the devolved the devolved structure that you you kind of grown up with seemed to me to be the most robust way to to make sure that the the union stays as close as it can to it, to its members and has that local dimension that is that is a, a key part of the the, the USP. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And to have good, strong leaders that are well connected locally. And Nottingham is a great example. A few, you know, what what started us in Nottingham was, again, a decision by the council to introduce a fairly uh, rough 
uh, disciplinary process. I mean, I have to say there's a great deal of institutional racism in the industry. Um, if you look at the Tran Department for Transport's re recent regulatory guidance that it gives to regulatory authorities across the country, it really majors very heavily on what happened in Rotherham, which has been a, uh, let's say, a, a right wing talisman for a while. But, it, you yeah. know, it, 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 in a way, it's it's rather disproportionate and unfair. And what we see is that um, more and more surveillance, more and more scrutiny, more and more harsh regulatory enforcement, but no protection. And so we see we see a we see a bad deal there that uh, drivers have been victimised by regulatory authorities, not getting a fair crack of the whip. Yeah. Uh, but then when it comes to the statutory protections that we should have, you know, no, nobody's home. Um, yeah. And, and that's quite unfair. So in Nottingham, we got going that way. Uh, Azim Hanif is our uh, our chairman there. But he has built a great relationship with the local council and with the local Labour Party. And uh, Nadia Whitum um, even donated part of her salary to uh, our organising efforts in um, in Nottingham, which is a great, wow. you know, gr great act of solidarity. For yes, indeed. indeed. And, and if we if we kind of look ahead, if it's possible to do so, as we kind of <laughs> as we emerge from the pandemic, as far as you're able to see ahead, what's the kind of strategic goals that you're, you're aiming at for, for the next kind of 18 months, two years or so? Well, we're, the working time is really a serious issue because what's at the heart of the gig economy problem is this wage theft around working time and this standby time in particular that I'm, I'm hooked onto a platform. I should get paid for the time that I'm waiting. If we do not pay for that waiting time, then all we're doing is encouraging the platforms to continue to overstock and oversupply on that platform. And that has an inverse effect. It creates positive network effects for Uber because Uber wants an immediate response time. A consumer pulls the app out, a car is with them in 90 seconds, and they think, isn't technology marvelous? But it's not. It's labor exploitation. It's excess labor hanging around waiting for that work that made that possible. How the effect of that for drivers is, you know, yield dilution, price dilution yeah. over time. Yeah. Because what Uber will Uber 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 justifies price cuts by saying, listen, you'll earn more money. You know, if your wheels ain't turning, you ain't earning, is what they yeah. used to say, right? Yeah. And and so it's this race to the bottom for drivers, but it also causes congestion, uh, poor air quality, and so on. And yeah. so until we have a point where either we have a cap on numbers by cities, and there's very little appetite either by national government or local authorities to do that, or these platforms start paying for this time, then we're going to have this problem of oversupply, which is which leads to poverty and pollution. So the working time issues absolutely has to be sorted out. Now, I listened to Martin Smith very carefully about this, and he said, you know, there's two factors to this. One, Uber doesn't want to do it. But two, you know, it's also the, you know, um, employment law in an app era. I, I don't agree with the second bit because it cannot be right that if I work for one app, then I get all my working time paid for it because this is what the Supreme Court is saying. But if I work for two, oh, maybe I won't get any rights at all. That can't be right. You know, so we've got to be able to sort this problem out. And if it needs more litigation to solve it, then we'll then that's what we'll have to do. But the one thing I want to say about, about strategic litigation and the importance of that, you know, you have to do everything. You have to organize, you have to litigate, you have to campaign, you have to do all of these things. But you, we shouldn't ever be afraid to litigate because, you know, our trade union forefathers would spin in their graves if they thought we walked away from some of the statutory rights that they, they fought and won yeah. for us. So we, we have to insist on these. We have to insist on the realization of these rights. And if we have to go to court, we have to do that because the government isn't enforcing the law either. So what choice do we have? We have to do all these things. Yeah. James, a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for, for, for being so candid and expressive and, and giving a real alternative or, or companion insight into, into the murky world of Uber. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I thought it was very engaging. James has got a lot of interesting stuff to say. We did, um, as a matter of fact, ask the mayor of London's office about some of the concerns raised by James. And a spokesperson told us that the mayor is committed to working with businesses and trade unions to deliver a better, greener future for the capital city. 
gig economy workers deserve the same rights as other workers and the mayor continues to urge businesses in the capital, including private hire companies, to pay their workers the London living wage and to give them the security they deserve. And, and the spokesperson also pointed out that neither the mayor or TfL, as the licensing authority, currently have the powers under legislation to require private hire companies to adopt particular pay and conditions for drivers. So what are the takeaways from from that discussion with James? Well, six things come to my mind. Um, first off, has Uber changed its corporate character? Or are founder Travis Kalanick and current CEO Dara Kashroshati cut from exactly the same cloth? This is the company and CEO who, don't forget, poured millions and millions of dollars into the profoundly anti-union campaign on California's Proposition 22 last year. As soon as the GMB deal was announced, there were full page ads in the Financial Times. And since then, adverts have appeared all over the London Underground proclaiming the benefits Uber drivers have. So culture change or grand deceit? The jury is probably still out. Second, Uber's business model is bad, bad, bad. It is built on having too many drivers, which means the earnings of each are too low and too many vehicles on the road, which screws the environment. The green dimension of all this seems sure to increase in prominence and may be a critical factor in cultural change. Third, despite the Supreme Court ruling, it ain't over. That this being the campaign for decent terms and conditions, and in part, it ain't over, because as we heard, Uber are trying to swerve transport regulations as a way to smother employment-related issues. Fourth, there's room for both GMB and ADCU to organise in Uber at the moment. In fact, in a weird and counterintuitive way, there may be some advantage to having two options for union membership. Three or four, actually, if you count the two IWGB branches who have an interest. I mean, it's a broader front to engage with potential members, a range of styles and approaches, a notion of choice almost. Now, that will not always be the case. I recognise that, especially as membership density grows, which is why the fifth takeaway for me has to be the courteous and civil way GMB and ADCU reps address each other. It's not impossible to see a rapprochement between these two at some stage in the future, but I do want to emphasise that's just me, only me talking. Six and last on my list are the issues around the future of app-based work and the importance of paid waiting time, something crucial highlighted by both GMB and ADCU. The argument goes like this. If you don't pay waiting time, then you compel drivers to work from multiple apps simultaneously. If they work from more than one app, then that undermines the notion that you can be an employee as opposed to a worker. This goes to the heart of the gig economy model, not just for couriers, but for many other occupations as well. But when it comes to couriers... For as long as competition law takes precedence over employment rights, and as long as we want an Uber to arrive within 90 seconds of using the app, it's going to be an uphill struggle. But then, when did workers or employees ever have it easy? That's just about it for this special episode. I really hope you've enjoyed what you've heard over the last half hour or so. If you've got any comments, any feedback, any suggestions for other special episodes, you can contact the show on email, unionjews at makesyouthink.com, or you can tweet us at Jews Union. We'd love to hear from you, love to hear your views and suggestions. If you could rate the show, review the show, subscribe to the show on the podcast platform of your choice, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you in hopeful anticipation. Past episodes of Union Jews are, of course, available, uh, including the linked programs on California's Prop 22 and the GMB's landmark deal with Uber. They're available from whenever you downloaded or accessed this episode from. I'd like to say a big thank you to James Farrer for giving up his time to join us. A big thank you to you for giving up your time uh, to join us. Take care, stay safe, and I'll see you next time on Union Jews. The Union Jews podcast is presented by me, Simon Sapo. It is a Makes You Think production.